Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. Now, as some of you may know, it's not cheap to keep Rich Planet on the air. So we're currently looking for somebody to sponsor the TV show again in the future. Without the current sponsor, it would have been impossible to get the 9 p.m. slot that we currently have. So anyone with deep pockets who's willing to sponsor the TV show, please get in touch via the richplanet.net website. For those who attended the uh, most recent speaking tour, you will know that I spoke a lot about subversion. I went through the results of a survey to find out which TV programs viewers believe are the most subversive and manipulative. I'm sure the results were probably not that surprising for some of you. Now, I'm asking you to take part in another subversion survey to try and find out the most subversive and manipulative false hero or role model. What do you mean by that, Richard? Well, if we look at former KGB agent Yuri Bezmenov's subversion chart, we see that one of the ways of subverting an entire nation is to use what he calls false heroes and role models. These are people who are promoted in the mainstream media to the masses in order to manipulate the masses into following particular ideals, follow particular morals, beliefs and live particular lifestyles which are subtly promoted by the fake role model. I could give you a list as long as one's arm of my particular favourite subversive fake heroes but I want you to do it for me. <coughs> Brian Cox. Now who would you vote for? Please email me your suggestion and I will compile a league table of the most subversive heroes and role models. Don't forget to state why you think they are fake and why their fake behaviour is subversive. I look forward to reading your suggestions. Now, coming up on today's show, I will be speaking to some UFO witnesses who, in my opinion, have given some excellent accounts of unexplained activity. These witnesses are just the tip of an iceberg of hundreds of people who have recently reported their sightings to the richplanet.net website, and I'd like to thank each and every one of you. Now, you may have watched the first two programs in this series entitled The Mars Rover Hypothesis, in which I presented quite a lot of evidence suggesting NASA could be running one massive deception regarding their Mars Rover programs. I've had a lot of feedback from these programs, some from people who have defended NASA and given alternative or perhaps conventional explanations for some of the Mars rover images. I've also had feedback from people who have given me more evidence arguing the rover missions were faked, such as a detailed analysis including calculations for the parachute used to allegedly land the Curiosity rover on Mars. Now, after the first program aired, I emailed five Mars rover NASA scientists with links to the program, asking them if they could explain all the anomalies. Now, just three or four days after this, we had the Beagle 2 found on Mars story come out, which just so happened to be found the day after our second Mars rover program aired. You just couldn't make it up, could you? I can also inform you that I actually received a reply from one of the NASA scientists who has agreed to answer my questions. He has so far answered one of them. I will be covering the Mars rover missions and the correspondence I've had with NASA in my upcoming lecture tour and looking at some of the feedback from viewers both for and against the hypothesis. A lot of people ask me about the forensic historians and how they're getting on. Uh, they're getting on, on fine. Uh, now, they uncovered the comprehensive history of the 6th century ruler, King Arthur, who was the king of Glamorgan and Gwent. Some academics still actually try to persuade people that King Arthur was a fictional figure when Wilson and Blackhead can actually take you to where he is buried. I caught up with Alan Wilson at his house in Newcastle a few months ago. See, Alan's here. Check of the devil. How are you, Alan? Right, I'm just taking a bit of video because people keep asking me how you are. Oh, I see. Well, I'm surviving. Surviving? Well, who keeps asking? Well, fans of your TV shows. <laughs> no, Alan. <I> <laughs> so people are asking if I'm still alive, is that it? Well, asking how you are. Uh, <laughs> they're not pushing up daisies. <laughs> <laughs> is that it? <laughs> One of his enemies, I said, how old is he now? He's 1983. 
He should be in the box by now. What, you, you can't afford to die, Alan? I right? can't afford to go. You <laughs> 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 said, I'm a silver enemy. You don't sell me a ticket. You don't look pal. I see you out of look pal because he just said, Stuart, he just said that he looks about 60. <laughs> you know that 20 years before he's in the box. <laughs> Have you got a friend for life? Yeah, I got a friend for life for Stuart. It's 60. <laughs> Must be trying to reduce the bill. I'm just, I'll just, just uh, this is the Arthurian uh, genealogy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> King Arthur. Yeah. Been up a while, that one. A few mistakes on there, though, isn't there? Just one or two minor ones. Nothing, nothing much. Nothing major. Yeah. You've got to understand that people went to America were the ordinary folk, and the rich people were being given 10,000 acres and 5,000 acres of land by the king in America. As if the king owned America with the original 12 colonies. Yeah, yeah. So the leading people out there were the aristocracy from here. So I'm getting old and slow, you know. You've been to doctors recently, Alan. I mean, what's because you had a bit of illness lately. Uh, yeah, yeah, nothing much. But you're better now, are you? No, nothing much. Yeah. Nothing much. Yeah. I'll have a cup of coffee, yeah, uh, Baron, please. Nothing to worry about. Nothing major to worry about, eh? Yeah. If you ask certain um, academic, you might call them, or university historians, they'll say that Arthur's a myth and that he never existed. That, that, that's what a certain that's, academics will actually say. Well, that's because they, uh, A, they're following a line of propaganda, a political propaganda line, which was really developed around 1840, 1850, which uh, abandoned the ancient histories of Britain, and they really haven't done any research. If you do just a little research, it becomes unmistakable. Yeah. The, the land of charters were taken for the Pope to see them in, I think, 1108 and 1120, you know. So they're, they're ancient charters, and they acknowledged to be such. Right. Um, we, we can get a copy of them, you know. Yeah, and just to mention, for those who are new to Rich Planet and new to Alan's work, uh, the, Alan has identified many sites in South Wales that are, that are significant to both the Dark Ages and sort of before the Dark Ages, BC, yeah. that the Welsh authorities and archaeological organisations, they don't want to touch. And uh, Alan's been trying for a large part of his life to get these sites excavated and acknowledged. But well, it's not... A People are educated in school, they go to school at 45 years old, they leave at 16 or 18, they go to college, and they're told a story, uh, let's call it history, it's his story. They're told a story and a, a line of thinking, and they don't seem to be able to break out of that line of thinking. Mm -hmm. But if you read histories of Britain, written before, say, 1820, and you read something written as a history of Britain after 1850, you're reading two completely different histories. Mm. Now that cannot be. Mm -hmm. You can't have a completely different history after 1850 and a completely different one before that date. It yeah. doesn't make sense. No. And the early histories have been abandoned. And they were abandoned in an era when Darwin sailed around the world and he came back with all sorts of information and said, hey, uh, the world was not created about 7,000 BC, as it says in the Bible, you know, we've got the Darwin series of evolution. You had other sort of things breaking out at the same era. And so the church and everybody else was in a panic. Alan's just shown me some uh, books here, which are school books, children's books even. Uh, 1907. 1907. And they're full of references to, to Arthur, Alan. Yes. So the, the story of Gwent, mm -hmm. educational uh, publishing company, mm -hmm. uh, Cardiff. So I'm just turning to this page here. So these books were in common use in schools uh, in the 1920s. Arthur's first duty was to march against the Saxons. Collecting his forces, mm -hmm. he marched towards Lincoln with uh, Magwin, king of North Wales, and Moirig, king of South Wales. Now, Moirig is Arthur's father. Yeah. Uh, well, his father, but South Wales usually means uh, the West Wales, South West Wales. Right. When the two armies met, Arthur inflicted a severe defeat upon the Saxons. Then, urging his chiefs to make a great struggle for their freedom, he assembled his increased forces and marched to Mount Baden, 
to await another onrush of Saxon warriors. So leave we Sir Lancelot in his lands, his noble knights with him, return again to King Arthur and Sir Gawain. They made a great host, uh, they number three score thousand, and all of them made ready for their shipping to pass over sea. And they saw they shipped at Cardiff, they sailed to Cardiff, mm -hmm. where the great harbour is in the mudflats.